Hi, I'm uh, Dr. Charles Davidson from Northwestern Medicine Bloom Cardiovascular Institute, and we're here at the first uh, Heart Team Summit joint venture between Barnes and St. Louis and Ascension in Indianapolis in Northwestern Medicine. I'm fortunate enough today to be uh, joined by Becky Hahn, uh, the world expert in echocardiography and certainly the world expert in tricuspid regurgitation and tricuspid valve disease. And uh, I'd like to just discuss a few things with Becky. She's uh, been leading this field for a number of years now. Becky, what, what got you interested in, uh, in tricuspid valve disease? Yeah, I, I think it's really the patients um, and the patients that we've seen. I, I'm sure that you remember some of your more memorable patients. And um, I had one in particular that had already had left heart surgery and should have probably had a repair of the tricuspid, but came in to, into us with massive ascites, mm -hmm. massive edema. Uh, the leaflets weren't even coming close and there was really nothing we could do. There was uh, no surgeon uh, would take her and so it became clear that we just knew so little about the valve um, and that uh, there were no really good guideline indications to intervene and um, it, 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 really, it really struck me um, at the suffering of, of some of these patients and so that's how I got interested in studying it and, and yeah. trying to work through some yeah. of the problems. And you've contributed so much to this and one of the things we've learned from you, you look at the guidelines and there's really nothing out there other than a 2A indication for, for diuretic therapy and why do you think the tricuspid valve has been so neglected and ignored in, in mechanical treatments and, and in uh, pharmacologic therapies. Yeah, I think, I think uh, part of the problem as far as interventions was uh, the surgical paper um, back in the 60s where uh, it was a very small number of patients with rheumatic disease that had their surgery on the mitral side done and their tricuspid went away, or regurgitation went away. Um, and in some of those, uh, some of that has been replicated in the rheumatic population, but what we're talking about really as functional disease in the absence of, of rheumatic disease. And um, for whatever reason, that one small paper with less than 30 patients um, really was used as the justification for not intervening at the time of left heart surgery. And so now we have this huge population of patients that's already had their left side surgery and therefore their, their re-op uh, risk is very, very high. Yeah, exactly. And so, um, you know, we, we're really in, in, in a bad uh, position here, and we, that's where all the transcatheter devices started right. coming around. You know, we, we really were, and you were part of this trial, the SCOUT right. trial. That, right. was, that was the first transcatheter trials that were really being done. That was the first. Right. It was the first out of the box. Right. It came a little too early, is my thinking. It did, it did. Um, because it was the first to show exactly what all the other devices have shown. Efficacy, at least a grade reduction, tremendous functional um, improvement. So New York Heart Association class, six minute walk test, all improved tremendously. Um, and yet that device is not, not going to be used anymore. And so um, it, it came a little too early because we didn't understand the disease process. We didn't, and I think it, it taught us a lot about how to evaluate the valve. A lot of yeah. work yes. that you did was how do you guide an intervention on a tricuspid valve, which is very different from the mitral valve. The imaging is different, the, the techniques are different, and so there was a lot of learning we did in that trial. Unfortunately, that technology has moved past it, but as we look at the technologies, and that's really why we're here today, is because there's now an explosion of tricuspid valve therapies. Yeah. And as we look at what's out there, the, the repairs particularly seem of interest, uh, annular reduction, leaflet modification. You know, what, what's your sense of where, where those might fit in? I know it's so early in the game, but yeah. when you start thinking about how do you parse that out? Yeah, I think we've learned a lot from surgery. And so because the annular devices are have a surgical predicate, I think we can learn a lot about who fails the surgical repair and really uh, you know, hone down on who might fail a transcatheter repair. And then those patients may need to have the leaflet device or an orthotopic valve replacement. And so even early on now in the, in the tri-repair study uh, from Europe, we've been able to look at some of the parameters that might predict uh, the inability to, to get a, you know, a really good reduction. I mean, we still get reduction. Right. Um, but you know, our goal is to get as much reduction as possible and to get the maximum amount, amount of reduction. Again, you don't want to have the patients that the surgeons are also not repairing, which is marked tethering, big bright ventricles. Those are patients that get replacements. Right. So I do think we can learn a lot from surgery. 
Um, but some of it is just because we so, know so little is just to do the trials and get as many patients in as possible. And your new grading scale, for those that aren't familiar, Becky's taking this out a step to the massive and torrential tricuspid regurgitation because our traditional scales were not really reflecting the population that we were seeing in clinic and there were possibly uh, candidates for the new therapies. I think one of the things that we've learned is that sometimes there's a disconnect between the grade of reduction of tricuspid regurgitation and the way the patients feel. Now, we should always try to get mild or less. Yeah. But what's your, what's your sense of that as well? That was, you know, in the SCOUT trial was the first that taught us that, right? Although we were getting really good reductions interprocedurally, right. um, we could at least get a, a one grade on that five grade scale uh, reduction in tricuspid regurgitation. Even if you had a one or two grade reduction and took it from torrential to severe, those patients all felt better. And part of it is that they, they come in unresponsive to their diuretics because the kidneys are so dependent on perfusion pressure and so once you have that high venous pressure, you're no longer perfusing your kidneys. And so we found, and maybe you, know, you could share your experience as well, that after the procedure, their they became diuretic responsive. And then we could actually, their medications all of a sudden started working and that's how they felt better. Right, we'd see people that were torrential, that ROAs were in the high ones to two range. You'd take them, you could take them down 50 to 70%, but they're still in a severe range, but those patients felt better and they continue to feel better. Their diuretics work better, their ascites may improve, yeah. you know, their fatigue and all improve. So, I, you know, I think that the goal of therapy obviously should be to replicate a, an acute surgical result, but that may or may not be uh, achievable in all of this population. Yeah. The other piece we'd like maybe could talk a little bit about is tricuspid valve replacement, which yeah. really is early in the game right now. So yes. we're in the full speculation mode, yeah. but what's your sense about where that might fit into the algorithm? Yeah, that's a really good question. So. In our early experience, so we did five of one device, um, and it was a real spectrum of patients from quite normal right ventricular function, but still torrential tricuspid regurg, to right ventricular function that was really quite borderline. Um, we had very low tapsies, and the global longitudinal strain was markedly reduced. And those are the ones that ended up failing, um, just not being able to um, to survive the uh, the acute increase in afterload from taking away all the regurgitation and the right heart is very sensitive to afterload and so we have to be really careful about picking those patients as well yeah. um, and and I think the goal is just to get everyone to refer patients in earlier so that we can really decide and, and they have the most number of options in treatment. Right and that's where I'd like to maybe conclude our discussion is the, the thing I've noticed over the five years we've been on this journey is that the referrals were coming way too late. Patients were already cirrhotic, their, their annuli were fully dilated, and the benefits of the therapy thus are much less at that point in time. And, and re-educating the community of early referral, we know where this disease is going, we know they're going to develop RV failure, pulmonary hypertension, severe ascites, and, and edema. But if we could get to these people earlier, I think we, we have a better chance of getting impact. And now with transcatheter therapies, we don't necessarily have to be thinking about surgery. So there's another, there's another step yes. in the treatment here. Maybe one last question, and go, I got you here, is combination therapies. Yes. Let's, let's just, yes. we, we talked about that kind of on the way over here. Uh, a clip and in an annual reduction, yes. you, know, w you know, that we're not even coming close to testing. But if you think forward, yeah. I think the surgeons are doing it. So when you talk to many surgeons, they've put the ring in, but they still see a coleptation gap, and they'll go ahead and put some sutures into the tricuspid valve. So the surgeons are already doing it, similar to the mitral side, and I think that, that combination therapy may actually work really well. I mean, I think that they feel it does, and maybe it's better than just an isolated ring. Um, you know, we always worry about these leaflet devices because they're in the middle of the orifice and will it close off other, other options. But the, the innovators in this field have been so creative that my guess is that we'll still have options even after some leaflet coaptation device goes in. Well, thank you, Becky. This has been an awesome conversation we've had today on tricuspid valve disease. Uh, this is Becky Hahn from Columbia University uh, joining us here today at our inaugural uh, Heart Team Summit meeting. And uh, we hope you all join us next year when we're in St. Louis at WashU as the host um, for our second annual Heart Team Summit meeting. 
Thank you very much. And Peggy, it's always a pleasure talking with you. Thanks for having me.